I just learned the most amazing thing about this airplane. I just spoke to the crew chief of the RB36 and he told me that this airplane flew to this museum. It flew to Castle Air Base, landed here. After they landed, they drained the hydraulic fluid out of it, which is the oil for the engines, and then they fired it up again and they ran both engines until they seized. This airplane flew here and then they destroyed the engines on the ground and that was on purpose per the Air Force for how they wanted this airplane parked. They do not want it to ever fly again. So here she is. She's got her motors on board but they are seized, ruined, will never fly again. That's the story of this one. Here comes my son. He's bought a couple of admissions for us. The back of these engines is oh, that's almost six feet across. She's big. 7960. Oh, oh we're getting, getting admitted here. Thank you. It always amazes me to see round head rivets in that area, right even up on the top. So this was a low pressure zone of the aircraft. The rivets are not even flush. I really wonder why. And the desert's taking her toll. We're at the bottom of the Great Valley in California. Quite a bit different weather here from around the corner in Mojave, the bottom of the Sierras. Just to the north of us here is Beale Air Force Base where this aircraft was based. We are just below Sacramento and this aircraft was based just above Sacramento.
Having a look at the what's been called the dipsy doodle of the wing, it changes where the shock wave is of the edge of the supersonic. The dip in the wing sets where the shock wave is. Everything is about the drag of where the shock wave is. And it's pretty interesting to see that forward edge, the leading edge of the wing dips. Oh, I'd say that's four or five inches. And if you see what I mean, we'll look down, we'll look down the leading edge. And you see the dip in it? From this angle too, you should be able to see that the engines are lined up six degrees different than the entire fuselage. So right now, you could look at the little dip in the wing, leading edge. And if you come this way a bit more, you can start to see that the engine is actually pointed into the ground when it's, um, when it's parked. The fuselage chine is level. And the inlet spikes are not symmetrical. There is a left and a right. You can mix them up. And they point kind of into the ground a bit too. They're super complicated. There is a museum in the north end of this valley that has a nose piece and an inlet cone sitting on the ground. I have not visited that museum, but I really want to, to inspect those components. The back of the nose piece is real. It's uh, got quite a bit of the telemetry in there for all the spy stuff. I believe it was a, a ground mapping radar type thing that basically took a picture of three clouds quite well. So the engine itself, the J58 Pratt & Whitney, is about half the size of this Nassau. The Nassau is very complicated with air passages going all kinds of different directions, doing different things. And the engine itself holds all the fuel system stuff, so they can swap out these engines pretty quick. They actually unhinge and the whole thing pivots up. And you can see that at the McMillville, McMinnville. Got a train ripping by right now. It's a busy day, Southern California. You're on the road with Norm and Chris, and we're at Castle Air Museum. <laughs> we brought our dirt bikes. We've been riding them in a couple places in Utah and Nevada on the way down here. Got a D21 drone and an SR71 Blackbird. <laughs> so pulling up the serial number, we have SR71A model serial number 61-7960 so they laid out the contract for this in 1961 however this one right here uh, assembly started on the 8th of December 1964 and it rolled out of the assembly plant where would that have been Palmdale this would have been Burbank or Palm Palmdale one of the two Lockheed plants I think Palmdale and so it rolled out on September 20th of 1965 and they called it number 960. He first flew on the 9th of February, 1966. And the last time it flew was on the 27th of February, 1990. I'm getting this from sr71.org. Great website. It's got a whole bunch of pictures of this aircraft. Over its career, number 960 flew a total of 2,669.6 hours. That's really quite a lot. So this is a, this is one of the birds that would have flown over Vietnam and all. This this would have been an in-service bird. With 2,600 hours, this was an in-service bird. This bird would have done a lot of reconnaissance missions. And you can kind of tell that because it's got the latest stuff on it. Um, they changed a few things over the years. And the latest ones had the, the latest nose, that whole nose comes off with four bolts. 
you can tell the latest model, uh, the latest flying versions with the latest stuff in them because of a few extra bumps and things on them. And the first thing I notice is that the, the nose has been, there's many different noses over the years and most of the noses do a whole bunch of different things. The radar mapping was the most developed thing that went into the nose, but also these blisters are sensors and those two little deals on the bottom, there's one on each side back there, those are some kind of ECM blasters. There's some kind of electronic warfare thing going on. You can tell this is one of the latest models going because of a few extra bumps and things on them. The blisters on the on the nose here are sensors and there's a couple of little deals underneath there, one on each side, that I believe are sending out electronic waves of electronic countermeasures. When you look at it, you see the cockpit at the front looks, it's actually pretty cozy in there. The rear seater, the RSO, He's just got this little tiny window. It looks like a little tiny window. But I've talked to a couple of those guys and they say that the, they could see tons out there. Their helmet was right there. That little window was just a few inches from their eyes. They had a really great field of view. They all say they, all say they were quite comfortable in there. The rear seater also has a periscope and he can look out the bottom of the aircraft. The pilot can't. The pilot has a periscope at the top of his canopy in the front there's a little periscope and he can look at he can look at his trail his engines and his trail and his tail he can he can look behind to see what's going on with the airplane the guy in the back can look underneath to see who's shooting at him <laughs> and that's the truth they saw missiles coming up uh, I see a train coming actually right now just offside here train tracks parallel the base.